Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Northport. We're glad to have you worshiping with us and we're glad to have you part of our worshiping community on this day. I have a couple of announcements. The first one is that next Sunday, May 16th, we will have a live in-person coffee hour at 1130 out on our Memorial Garden patio. We're hoping that it's going to be nice weather and that we'll be able to be outside, but if not, we will open the doors and gather in the heart room. So please come bring your own cup of coffee as we're not allowed to make coffee here, but bring your own cup of coffee or tea or whatever you'd like to drink and come for a time of fellowship and a time to reconnect with friends. That is next Sunday at 1130, that's May 16th. Also, we have a new members class for those that are interested in membership here at First Press, and that class is happening on Tuesday, May 18th at 7.30 via Zoom. So if you or somebody you know is interested in that class, please email the church office so that we can get your information and we can send you the Zoom link and also some more information ahead of time. So that's the new members class on Tuesday, May 18th, and then new members would join on Pentecost Sunday, which is May 23rd. So we have some exciting things coming up in the life and ministry of our church, even as we continue to be the body of Christ while we're not together yet in in-person worship. As most of you know, we will gather for in-person worship and reopen the sanctuary on Sunday, July 18th. So we're looking forward to seeing all of you back then and you will hear some more information in your email and, in, and announcements about what that will look like and what that will entail. So we're excited that we will be re returning in July. And today the flowers in the sanctuary are given in loving memory of Ed Bell, who passed away two years ago. They're given by his family. Also, there is a tree in the Memorial Garden that has been planted in Ed's honor. That is the step one of phase two of our Memorial Garden. So we are beginning phase two and you'll hear more information about ways that you can participate or donate a tree or a flower or bush or something for a loved one that has that to honor a loved one. So you'll hear more information about that. But again, these flowers and this tree is in loving memory of Ed Bell. And now let us turn our hearts to worship. Please stand and join me in the responsive call to worship printed in your bulletin. Sing to the Lord a new song, for our God alone is Lord of all. Break into joyous songs of praise. Let all the earth celebrate and rejoice, for our God comes in victory. With righteousness and justice for all, let us worship the Lord our God.
Friends, as we gather around the baptismal font, we are reminded that the ever-flowing waters of baptism are a constant reminder that there is nothing we could ever do or say that would separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In confidence and with humility, please join me in the unison prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Compassionate and gentle God, you have created us in love to be your people. You have called us in love to be your light. You have promised us in love that you are our home. But in this space of honesty, we confess we have often lost sight of these divine gifts. We have forgotten what it means to fully live as your people, to shine as your light, and to trust in your ability to work in and through us. Forgive us. Forgive us and send your spirit anew, your spirit of renewal and transformation, your spirit who appends our lives, your spirit that calls us back to you. And then remake us in your image once again, so this congregation may move into your future with confidence and hope. We pray these things in the name of the one who rose from the grave. Friends, there is good news. The statement I'm about to make is sure, and it's worthy of your full acceptance. You can bet your whole life on this statement. And the statement is this, that if anyone, anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old life is over. The new life in Christ has begun. Friends, hear and believe this very good news that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As forgiven and reconciled sinners, we pass the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Testament lesson today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 130. Listen now for God's living word to us. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Our New Testament scripture lesson comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. This takes place after Paul has had his dream where the Lord told him to go to Macedonia, after he has converted Lydia. And this story tells about the healing that, was, that led to a public confrontation and Paul and Silas in prison. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl 
who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do? to be saved. They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds and he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we know that we have all come being in some sort of prison with something blocking our path or our faith on our journey with you. We know that we have not come or tuned in this morning to hear anybody's human words or opinions, but we have come to hear your living word to us. To that end, O oh God, pour through me this day the gift of preaching, that by a miracle of your grace, these words might be transformed from my human words into your living word to each and every person who hears them, and we know you will, O oh God, for we pray with great anticipation in the strong name of Jesus, the risen and the reigning Christ. Amen. So if you remember last week, we heard in our scripture text about the conversion of Saul to Paul. This week, we'll fo focus on the missionary journey of Paul. Today in our text, we discover that Christ leads us into places so dark that our only light is a song. In the preceding chapters of Acts, we left our missionaries Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy after they had just received a vision to go and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in Macedonia, which is modern Greece. The first city they stopped at was Philippi, and apparently their first convert they made was a woman named Lydia. Lydia's home was in the province of Asia Minor, but she had moved to Philippi to run the local franchise that sold very expensive purple cloth. 
So she had something like an ancient Gucci or Armani boutique. She was probably wealthy. After she was converted, she insisted that the missionaries stay with her. So far, so good for our missionaries. They had a new convert with a big house, which was perfect for the church. This Greek thing seemed to be working out just fine for the missionaries. As the missionaries went back and forth to their place of prayer, a slave girl with an evil spirit began running behind them saying, these men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. Now this was actually quite true. The demonic always recognizes the danger of salvation. As this girl continued day after day, she began to really annoy Paul. So, as the text tells us, very much annoyed, Paul turned to her and ordered the demon to come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, notice that Paul was not filled with compassion for this girl, which I sort of find reassuring. Essentially, he cast out the demon because he was irritated by her, which is, which is a good enough reason to get rid of evil. After a while, you just get tired of putting up with it. It's also significant that Paul didn't gather the community together to pray about this, nor does he set up a task force to study the demon problem. He simply calls on the name of Jesus to heal this tormented soul. This slave used to make her owners a lot of money by telling fortunes. So when Paul cast out the demon, he also cast out their means of exploiting this girl. This infuriated the owners who dragged Paul and Silas before the magistrates and said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews. They said nothing about the girl being healed, but they do mention that Paul and Silas are Jews. It's interesting that they didn't bring Luke or Timothy who were Gentiles, but Paul and Silas who were Jews. Then the whole crowd got whipped up into racist agitation and started attacking Paul and Silas. So to keep the peace, the magistrates had the missionaries beaten with rods and thrown in prison. This is completely unjust. Paul and Silas had done nothing wrong. Simply by freeing a young girl of a demon, the missionaries had lost their freedom. The men who were exploiting the girl appealed to the anti-Semitism of the crowd and the fear of the magistrates to get a little payback. And it looks as if they may have gotten away with it. Also, Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, which made this treatment illegal. So nothing about this is right or just. Now I have to confess, if I were Silas sitting in a dark jail cell next to Paul with my feet in stocks, dabbing the blood that was running off my shoulders, I would have been tempted to ask Paul, are you really sure about this vision you had for us to come to Macedonia? Paul, are you sure this was Jesus? Maybe it was just a dream. You know, maybe it was a really bad dream. If God really wanted us here, why would God let this happen to us? Ah, the question of theodicy. All of theology always leads to the question of theodicy. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people, Christian people? My nephew, Nicholas, is eight years old and lives in New York City. And he goes to Sunday school at the Brick Presbyterian Church in New York City. And as you know, most of you know that the Zoom has become the popular Sunday school forum. So my sister, his mother, was teaching a Sunday school class on Zoom. And it was several weeks ago, the teachers asked the kids to talk about their path on walking with Jesus. They said, tell us your life story and your path. And she said that all of the eight-year-olds, every single one of them, instead of talking about birthday parties or when their siblings were born, talked about the day they were born and then COVID. 
Now remember, they're eight years old, they don't have a long story to tell, but it's very interesting that they would go from the day they were born to COVID. So they turned the Sunday school lesson around a little bit, having heard those responses, and they said, that the Sunday school teacher said to these eight-year-olds, so tell us, along your path in life, this past year during COVID, can you tell us examples of where you can find God being with us and God being present in your life? And so my nephew, Nicholas, whose mother was teaching the class on Zoom, said, I couldn't find one example of where God was with us because if God had been with us, God would not have allowed COVID to happen in the first place. Now my sister, having been the teacher, was mortified at this response. But there is truth in that response, isn't there? How many of us have wondered this last year, this last 14 months, how could God allow this to happen? As a pastor, I hear that question quite a lot. Why do things like this happen? Why, if we are on a mission from God and we are God's people as Christians, does God allow us to get taken off the path in our mission? Well, if your mission was given to you by God, it will inevitably be met with re resistance at some point. When that happens and when the going get, gets real hard on your path, the great temptation is to ask ourselves if maybe we misunderstood God. Maybe God didn't say Macedonia. Maybe God said to go to Bermuda. Maybe I was never supposed to come here. Maybe I was never supposed to be married or have children. These are questions you ask when you have been beaten up trying to fulfill a mission. You even start to wonder if this whole business of a call from God is just a lot of malarkey. Where is God on your path? The fascinating thing is that we have no record in scripture of either Silas or Paul asking these questions or doubting their call from God. Instead, we are told that they spent their evening in jail praying and singing hymns. We are even told that the other prisoners were listening to them as they sang as if they really had a choice. So a little revival broke out in the dark corners of the jail in Philippi. Historians would love to know exactly what those hymns were and what Paul and Silas sang, but we don't know that for sure. The chances are good, since they were Jewish, that they sang psalms. Since they had been put in jail, in part because they were Jews, did they sing from Psalm 129? which says, often they have attacked me from my youth. Let Israel now say, often they have attacked me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of wicked. So when you are on a dark place on the journey, hurt because of your race, your gender, your political party, or your religious convictions, you face a great choice that will determine the rest of your journey. If you choose to only nurse your hurts, you are essentially choosing to be always a victim. It doesn't matter where else you go or who else you meet, you will continue to position yourself as a victim. These men, Paul and Silas, are refusing to be victims. They choose instead to let their songs of praise rise as a protest against evil. In his autobiography, The Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela claimed that in his 27 long years in a South African prison, the singing of the prisoners was essential to his ability to survive. That's because as they sang, the prisoners protested that their souls were still free. It takes more than stone and iron to imprison a human soul. During this time when we are not worshiping together in the sanctuary and we're not able to sing the hymns, we have heard how beautifully the Warren family has sung our hymns for us. 
But during this time when we're not singing together, we include the words of these hymns in your bulletin each week. And the reason we do that, we'd like to encourage you to sing at home, but when, we, when you read these words, take them in. Don't pay attention to the notes that you might not sing correctly. Don't pay attention to all the other things that are going on. Listen to the words, hear them. They tell a story. If you want to know your theology, read the Bible. But if you really want to know what you believe, read your hymnal. The hymn that we will sing today, all of us together, as the Warrens will lead us, is Lead On, O King Eternal. Pay attention to the words. The words talk about courage for life's journey. After surviving a concentration camp, Viktor Frankl wrote that the last of all human freedoms after surviving a concentration camp is to determine your response to any circumstance. Here in this holy sanctuary and wherever you are worshiping today, we use our last freedom to sing praise to God, the King who leads us. It's our greatest protest against the evil and our way of casting out the demonic temptation to fear. So we can join Paul in claiming, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Why are we not destructed? Because we sing. So maybe Paul and Silas sang from Psalm 130 that we read earlier. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope, my soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. If Psalm 129 is a praise of protest, Psalm 130 is a praise of hope. And hope is always found in the hard places of life, the places of suffering. The biblical view of suffering is not that it is a judgment, nor is it that which can be avoided if you are only careful. According to the Bible, suffering is an invitation into the depths of where we are at the heart of the real issues of our life. Our great hymns of faith teach us that no matter how deep it gets, God is deeper still. So suffering, heartache, or conflict are never the bottom line. Beneath it all is still our God. So in the bottom places of life, we find hope. That's why I love the line in our creed that reminds us that Christ descended into hell before ascending into heaven. That reminds us that it doesn't matter how low we sink, even to hell itself, we will find a savior. Only in him can we then ascend to heaven. So he alone is our hope. Why do Paul and Silas sing? Because they know how they are not Jews or even citizens of Rome. From the depths of their souls, they know that they are citizens of the coming kingdom of God and the gates of hell cannot prevail against that kingdom. While they sing with such faith, the earth begins to heave, the shackles and the chains unfasten, the doors to their jail break open, and they are made free. Whenever the people of faith insist upon hope, the earth shakes, injustice falls, and a little more room for heaven is made on earth. Now when the jailer sees this, assuming that his prisoners have escaped, he prepares to kill himself, knowing that his life will be required. Seeing what the jailer is about to do, Paul stopped him and said, we are all still here, staring at these men who had clearly been saved by God. What else could the jailer do but ask, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved from my despair and from this lousy job? What must I do to be saved from my sins and from my discovery that I have wasted most of my life on the wrong side? They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. That night, 
the jailer took the missionaries home to wash their wounds, and the missionaries washed away his despair in holy baptism. So let's look at who we now have as charter members of the church in Philippi, a wealthy businesswoman from Asia, a Greek slave girl who used to tell fortunes, and a Roman prison guard. What could possibly bind together such a diverse little group? They had all been saved by our, by our world conquering hope. So if you are tired of being a victim and tired of being stuck in the dark places, there is still room in this community of hope for you. Apparently, it doesn't matter how wealthy or poor you are or what race or nationality. It doesn't matter if you have been enslaved by addictions or sin. It doesn't even matter if you have spent most of life on the wrong side. All that matters, all that matters is that you ask the question, what must I do to be saved? You start asking that question, and before you know it, a holy song will emerge from the depths of your soul. Amen. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us now join our hearts together in the affirmation of faith. In life and death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the, one, the Holy One of Israel, whom we alone worship and serve. God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness to all peoples, to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will 
The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, ever redeeming, ever sustaining, ever showing yourself to us in new, surprising, and magnificent ways, you call us by name, you seek us out, and embrace us with your love, in spite of our resistance, our ambivalence, our doubts, and our fears. You are our vine, and we are your branches. You have given us minds to think, question, create, and wonder. And although not having all the answers to our questions often frustrates and confuses us, we know that you made us in your image and this ability to wrestle with all the complexities of life brings us closer to you. So we come to you as we are in all our personal complexities. Some of us are experiencing doubt and fear. We pray for a capacity to engage with mystery and trust in you. Some of us are finding it hard to love our neighbors. We are all too aware of our own anger, resentment, envy, and irritation expand our capacity to forgive, to be charitable in spirit, and focus our energies on that which brings us joy. Some of us, O oh God, cannot feel your presence, and the sense of separation pains us. Help us abide in you as you abide in us. We lift up to you all those for whom we love and care, who have special need of your presence and grace today. Be with those who grieve the loss of loved ones. Place your tender healing balm on the raw wounds of absence and temper the heartache of grief with peaceful memories and gratitude for love that continues beyond the grave. Be with all of those who endure illness of body, mind, and soul. Relieve them of emotional anxiety and physical pain. Provide wise and supportive friends, friends and caregivers to journey beside them. On this day, O oh God, we give you thanks for mothers, mothers in our midst and in our memories. 
We give you thanks for those who have been like a mother to us. We're thankful for grandmothers, for aunts, sisters, daughters, all of the women that you have placed in our lives to be our companions and our caretakers. We know, O oh God, that there are many places in the world, both near and far, that know the corruption of hate, distrust, violence, and injustice. Be with the hungry, the homeless, the ill, and the injured. Teach us how to work for justice and how to be ambassadors of your peace, your peace that can turn swords into plowshares, enemies into friends, despair into hope, and fear into love. Be with all of us no matter where we are on our journey, that when the going gets tough, we know where to turn. Be with us this day and always. We trust in the unfailing love of your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, remember, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what you have done. All that matters is that you ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Jesus Christ is the answer to that question. And now as we go, may God's grace, mercy, and peace from the God we know as creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all be with us and flowing through us this day and every day. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>